You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. You all sound so great. It's wonderful sitting right there. I get to hear all your voices coming forward. And I love it when uh, I love women's conferences, when women can sing together. It's just really sweet. And uh, the our worship ladies over here, just fabulous. Sounds great. So what a treat. Uh, old Scottish preacher Samuel Rutherford said, Believe God's word and power more than you believe your own feelings and experiences. Your rock is Christ, and it is not the rock which ebbs and flows, but your sea. I love how he says, believe God's word and your and his power more than you believe your own feelings and experiences. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this session. So let me uh, open again, just asking for the Lord's grace on this particular session. Father, we do thank you for uh, this this session that we're going to be looking at here, Lord, as we look at Abraham's life story. And Father, we do need to believe you. We want to believe your word more than we believe our feelings And what's right in front of us, our experiences, Lord, we ask that you would help us to do that, that we would be um, women who, by faith, put our hope and trust in you so that you would be put on display in our lives and uh, that you would get glory for yourself. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you're at all familiar with Abraham's life story, uh, then it's easy to imagine that he could have experienced discouragement, um, that he may have been um, acquainted with despair, and definitely frustration over the circumstances in his lives. You know that he, when um, had major moves in his life. Um, then when he did get moved to his new place, he, he lived in a tent. So he lived temporary living for the rest of his life. Um, so if you've ever lived in any kind of temporary situation, then you know what that's like. Um, he, he went through years of infertility and childlessness, he and his wife. So he had opportunity to be frustrated, to be discouraged, to experience despair. And and yet the overall picture of Abraham is not one of discouragement or sorrow or anger, but it's one of faith and courage and hope. And even when nothing changed in his life, he still trusted and hoped in the Lord. Hebrews 11.8 has this to say about Abraham's faith in the Lord. It says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. So he probably felt a little fearful about leaving all that was familiar and going to a land that he knew nothing about. He was basically starting over in life. And, you know, as I mentioned, you know, if you've ever done that, then you know all the uncertainty of moving to to a new place and all the newness and unknowns and all that that can bring. I mean, even just starting a new job um, or or flying into a new place and hoping you're going to find friends. You know, all of that can uh, bring with it uncertainty, can it? And, you know, so just all the new things that, that happen. And so Abraham experienced that. Hebrews 11, 9 through 10 tells us this about Abraham. By faith, Abraham lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, who were fellow heirs of the same promise. And Abraham was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. 
And we can imagine what that was like for him. You know, it, it is definitely difficult to be the new guy, to be the new person. And I think there's a few of you who've moved here, you know, fairly recently. You know what that's like when you're the new guy. And uh, to be a, a temporary dweller in the, in the land. And uh, there was a, a season in our lives when we were in limbo. And um, it It was easy to be tempted to be impatient during that limbo time. We wanted it to be over, to struggle with longing and envy for everybody else who had all their stuff and ours was still in storage for another month and then another month and another month. You know, that that temptation to feel frustrated um, and just even sorrow that we're not in a permanent place. And yet for many of us, we live really, it feels like even if we're living in a permanent place, our lives are somewhat temporary in limbo. And yet Hebrews 11 tells us that one of the ways that Abraham overcame his emotions during that time of temporary in his life was by trusting in the Lord and his word, that he was looking for the city which has foundations. Abraham trusted in God's promises despite his current circumstances and in spite of how he may have felt. And that's why we're going to be looking at Romans 4, 18 through 21, because it helps us see how we can live well and give God glory. Now, Romans 4, 18 through 21 is an unlikely text for us to turn to if we're going to learn how to deal with our feelings. That is not why Paul wrote Romans 4, 18 through 21. So I want to put it out there. Um, The context is where Paul has been carefully explaining that salvation only comes through faith and it's not by any human merit. And yet to illustrate his point, then he describes Abraham's faith, which rested in God alone for his salvation and his right standing before the Lord. And it was He uses Abraham as an example because even during Abraham's lifetime and during the lifetime of Isaac and Jacob, the law of God had not even been written or given to the people yet. So they hadn't had it. Abraham lived in the time before the law. And yet Abraham put his faith and trust in God. And that was beautiful to God. It was accepted by God. And that is where where we have that Abraham was justified by his faith. And so Paul is explaining all of this. And um, yet as he's explaining and giving Abraham as an example of his faith and hope in the one true God for salvation, we can also get some examples and and principles that we can glean for our own lives of how we can trust the Lord. The purpose of the passage is not for us to learn how to deal with our emotions. The purpose of the passage is to show how Abraham put his faith in the one true God, not in works, not in any other thing. And yet we can still glean encouraging truths from the example of Abraham as as we look here in Romans 4, 18 through 21. So the text says, In hope against hope, Abraham believed so that he might become a father of many nations according to what had been promised to him. So shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, Abraham contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, Abraham did not waver in unbelief, but he grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and he was fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. 
So that brings us to our first point, which is trusting God no matter how you feel from verse 18. And the verse opens with, in hope against hope, Abraham believed. And that phrase, hope against hope, means to have hope or trust, even when a situation appears to be hopeless, Um, to hope very strongly in something, even though it's not very likely, most most likely, humanly speaking, it's just not going to happen. So we have to ask ourselves, well, what was going on in Abraham's life that he kept hoping was going to happen, even though it seemed most likely that it couldn't happen, that it wouldn't happen? Well, Genesis 11.30 tells us that Sarah was barren. She had no child. But then if we continue to read in Genesis, in chapter 12, God tells Abraham something amazing. God tells Abraham, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. Now, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? But Abraham and Sarah had already had years of childlessness. It had just said Sarah was barren. They knew she was not going to have any children. And yet, God now tells Abraham, but I'm going to make you into a great nation. And God goes on to tell us in Genesis 12, 4, that Abram, Abraham at this time was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So he was already old. He was already advanced in years. They were both Abraham and Sarah were past the time when most people would have already had children. And yet God now gives this promise to Abraham. And so Abraham goes. Abraham was 75 years old when God made him that promise. And God had promised him, you will have a son or an heir. He doesn't necessarily specify, but almost always it was, it was going to be the son because that was where the heir would come from. And God also promised that he was going to make him into a great nation in a new land. And we know from the scriptures that Isaac wasn't born to Abraham and Sarah until Abraham was 100 years old. So that means that Abraham waited 25 years from the time that God gave him that promise until Isaac is born. That's 25 years of waiting, 25 years of waiting until that baby was born. If ever there was a man that we can learn from, who we can learn from about dealing with our emotions when we're waiting on the Lord, it is Abraham, which means that there's, re- there's hope for us too, when we are learning to deal with circumstances in our lives where we're waiting upon God, where we're waiting to see what God is going to do, then we can glean from our text When Romans 4.18 tells us that Abraham hoped against hope, and yet he believed God. There wasn't anything in Abraham's experience at, at this point in time. It wasn't like there was all these examples of people who were past the prime of life being able to have children in their old age. I mean, that had never happened before, but Abraham believed God. That That is stellar, isn't it? And he hoped, in spite of the fact that he knew, my body is old. My body is old. Sarah's body is old. It's not really going to happen, but God says it's going to happen. And so I'm going to hope, and I'm going to hope, and I'm going to hope for 25 years. Abraham put his faith in the promises of God above his circumstances and uh, definitely above his feelings. Abraham modeled for us that it's possible to trust God no matter how you feel, no matter what you are going through. And I am sure that in a room of this size, that there are some of you who are going through circumstances that are hurtful and hard. They are vexing. They are dire. uh, Where you feel that your life is just one big test of your faith. And you feel like you are being stretched 
and stretched almost to the breaking point. What's that name? Um, Elastigirl. We know about Elastigirl from the Incredibles. I love her. You know, and the, that's that stretching. But we feel that way sometimes. It's like, surely it's going to break. Um, but the Lord does that at times in our lives. Abraham did have a specific promise from God that he was that God was going to do this for Abraham. But Abraham still needed to believe that promise that God would do what he said. Now, we don't have that specific promise. You know, you're going to have a baby. You know, that would be kind of scary. I mean, um, I'm already, I'm a grandma. You know, I'm 60 years old. And, you know, so I'm already past my prime. And to be told, okay, you're going to have a baby in 25 more years. Like, are you kidding me? (laughs) But then to wait and see what God would do. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? And that's where Abraham was. But in spite of that specific one, we ha- we do have specific promises that are given to us in the word of God. We do not have to go out there looking for a specific, the Lord has given me a promise. No, no, that is, a, that is false. But these, the promises that are contained here, we can trust in. And we can believe the promises of God, like 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation is overtaking you, but such as is common to man. Why? Because God is faithful, and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. And what this 1 Corinthians 10.13 tells us and teaches us and we can cling to is a promise from God that because God is faithful, he will help us when we are facing temptations, like when we're tired and our emotions are just right at the surface. And we feel like if if I'm not careful, all this yucky stuff is just going to come out and my family is not going to be blessed. The Lord is going to be dishonored. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, He will provide a way of escape for us if we will look for to him for help. That he's in the midst of the struggle, trouble with us, that he will help us because he is faithful. So we can lean on 1 Corinthians 10.13. That's a promise for us. We learn from Abraham that it is possible to trust the Lord when we're feeling emotional, when we're feeling weak, when we feel vulnerable, when we feel that all hope is lost. It is possible to defer an emotional outburst by putting our trust in the Lord and reminding ourselves of the truth of his word and maintain our hope against hope by believing in God's word. And that brings us to our second point, facing facts without becoming overwhelmed, from verse 19. Without becoming weak in faith, Abraham contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. You know, there's facts, and the facts are that Abraham's body was no longer working. But Abraham faced those facts. The text says that he took really a good hard look at the situation. Now, I think this is significant for us to note. Um, Abraham didn't, you know, cover his eyes or ears or just say, I'm just not going to believe it or any of those kinds of things. He took a good hard look at the facts. My body is dead. Sarah's body is dead. There's no way this is going to happen unless the Lord does something. So he looked at the facts, and yet he was not overwhelmed by the facts. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes facts completely overwhelm me. I'm I'm a little bit more ostrichy than Abraham. I just want to put my head in the sand. Do not tell me the facts. I would just don't, I don't want to deal with that right now. I'm feeling a little bit out of my depth, you know? And so this has really encouraged me to help me to look to see, no, Lord, 
I can face the facts because you have promised you will never leave me or forsake me, for one thing. So I don't need to be afraid at looking at the facts. Because sometimes facts are scary, aren't they? And yet the text tells us that Abraham faced the facts about his body, but he didn't give in to despair. Sometimes when I face the facts about things, I'm like, give way into despair. What? <laughs> There's all kinds of fretting going on. Um, and yet Abraham faced facts and he applied the truth from the promises of God to his situation. And I think this is a really crucial step for us to apply when we are dealing with our emotions and life situations. When something is bothering us and we're afraid, then we want to hide from those facts. But if we face them like Abraham did, we will stand upon the promises of God. You remember that hymn, Standing on the Promises That Cannot Fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear prevail, or assail, by the living word of God, what? I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. I'm standing, I'm standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, my Savior, because I'm standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. And when we struggle with fears and anxiety or anger or bitterness or frustration over anything that's happening in our lives, we need to remember that we, just like Abraham, can trust the Lord no matter what our situation. Psalm 2510 is one of my favorite go-to texts for me when I'm struggling with my facing my facts and especially when the circumstances are difficult. Psalm 2510 says, all the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. There is such comfort presented to us in Psalm 2510. It says, all the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth for those who belong to him. Now, you may be walking on a path right now where the Lord has you. And if you were to put a street sign on your path that said um, the name of your path, what would be the name of your path? Would it be loving kindness and truth lane? <laughs> or would it be not a chance, I don't want to go down this way, you know, private circle or whatever, <laughs> lost and wandering, yeah, you know, all of those, so our lanes, you know, sometimes the, the paths that we're on, it's like, that's, I'm not labeling it that, and yet, what do we see from Psalm 2510? All the paths of the Lord our loving kindness and truth. So we need to look at the path we're on. What are we calling it? What lane is it or what street or avenue? And does it line up with Psalm 2510? We need to relabel it and then reorient our thinking so that we will look at the path that we are on and recognize, no, this is not a terrible street for me to be on. This is the path from the Lord. And God says, this is his loving kindness to me. This is the truthful right way. There is no darkness on this street that I am on. It truly helps us to reapply, re, realign ourselves, to apply faith to our situation so that we can speak truth to our hearts about our current situations. And what we saw from verse 18 is that Abraham trusted in the Lord in spite of how he felt. And so can we, when we remember the truths from God's word. And verse 19, we see that Abraham faced the facts about his situation, and yet he didn't become overwhelmed by it. And so can we, when we wait upon the Lord in faith. And then we come to our third point, standing firm upon the promises of God. In verse 20, it says, Yet with respect to the promise of God, Abraham did not waver in unbelief, but he grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. And verse 21 says, Because Abraham was fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. 
we see that Abraham didn't waver in unbelief. Instead, he grew strong in faith and gave glory to the Lord. And yet this was only possible because Abraham believed that God was able to bring his promises to to pass, to fruition in Abraham's life. Abraham trusted that God was able to do everything that he had promised. God promised that he would make Abraham into the father of many nations. God promised that he would plant Abraham in a new land. And God promised that from Abraham, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And it was that promise that Abraham kept in his mind. And our text says that Abraham didn't waver in unbelief. He didn't doubt. While he contemplated his dead body and Sarah's, he didn't doubt while he waited for God to bring the promise to pass. He didn't doubt for 25 years. I think that puts a huge per- new perspective on trusting, doesn't it? <laughs> I, Abraham didn't waver in unbelief in that kind of flip-floppy way of uh, believing God and not trusting him. But that doesn't mean he didn't struggle. He's still human. He still would have to realign his thinking. He still had to apply faith. And probably every single day and multiple times throughout the day. And probably there were different seasons during that 25 years when it was harder than it was at other times. John MacArthur has some great thoughts in his commentary on this passage about that doubting, that not wavering. He says this, but struggling faith is not doubt, just as the temptation to sin is not itself sin. He has more to say, but let's just stop there for just a moment. I want you to hear that again. Struggling faith is not doubt, just as the temptation to sin is not sin itself. Now, we oftentimes, we we can understand that there is the difference between temptation that can come at us, and yet um, it sometimes gets a little muddy, muddied in our thinking, and we we are not sure when that turns into sin. But temptation can come at us, and if we turn away by faith, then it's not going to be, it's not going to be sin in us. Well, the struggling in faith to believe God in faith and continue in that faith is, is not doubt. That is that is giving, not giving into the temptation to not believe God. Okay. So that's what as John MacArthur is talking about. He goes on to say the very fact that Abraham was trying to understand how God's promise could be fulfilled indicates that Abraham was looking for a way of fulfillment, although he could not yet see a way. Weaker faith might have simply succumbed to doubt. Sincere struggling with spiritual problems comes from a strong, godly faith. Such faith refuses to doubt and trusts in God's promises even when no no way of fulfillment is humanly imaginable. God's testing of his children's faith is designed to strengthen their trust, and they should thank him for it, hard as it seems to be at the time. When Abraham was tested by God, he grew strong in faith, end quote. What we see here is sincere struggling with spiritual problems comes from strong godly faith. And that's what John MacArthur's talking about there in his quote. Abraham trusted the Lord in spite of his feelings. As Abraham faced facts without becoming overwhelmed, and as Abraham stood firm upon the promises of God, his faith grew stronger. In fact, it wouldn't be too far off the mark to say that the longer that Abraham had to wait, the more his faith grew. I just find Abraham's example here in Romans four eighteen through 21, the best and the most convicting and the most exciting and challenging example ever. I I think it's so convicting because for me, the longer I have to wait for something, you know, that's when I get the longer and then it's like, 
I guess it's not going to happen, you know, and we do the whole I'm schlumpy and, you know, we get a little frustrated or, you know, it's, it's just not happening, you know, that stuff. Maybe y'all don't do that. Uh, it's something I learned in Kentucky. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, isn't that what happens to us? The longer we have to wait, sometimes like God's never going to do this and he doesn't love me and I might as well eat worms. You know, those things that we get. And yet Abraham set his eyes upon his God and he chose not to give into unbelief. He chose to believe God and he lived by faith. We are responsible for our response to what God is doing in our lives. We, we have a choice to make. Am I going to believe God or am I going to respond in unbelief? Or am I going to do what's natural? It is natural for us to not believe God. It's a supernatural act to trust the Lord. We must be relying upon the Lord's help if we are going to believe him. We cannot do this on our own. We cannot trust God. I'm going to trust God today. (laughs) And before we know it, what are we doing? We've fallen into sin, isn't it? And yet, Abraham shows us it is possible to trust God day after day after day, to continue to give him glory, to stand firm, to not give way to unbelief, to not give way to our feelings or our fretting or all these other areas that we are tempting us. We can grow strong in faith if we are leaning on the Lord. And verse 21 provides us with a clue as to how Abraham's faith was strengthened. It says that Abraham was fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Abraham grew strong in faith because he knew God and he knew God's character. He had a strong faith because he knew how big God was. That's what made all the difference for Abraham. He knew that God was the creator, that he spoke the world into existence, that God could do anything he wanted. He knew he was a, that God pre, um, preserved Noah and his family in the flood. He, he'd seen all and heard all the things that God had done. And so Abraham knew how mighty and powerful and faithful and loving and patient and kind God is. And so Abraham knew that God was fully able to bring to pass whatever it was that he had said, that if God said it, that was good enough. There is no way we're we're going to ever grow stronger in faith in times of waiting and difficulty unless we do what Abraham did and think on God's character. We have to. We have to spend time in the Word thinking on what we know about the Lord, how faithful He is. Abraham thought about how God had dealt with those who'd gone before him. He, Abraham thought about God's complete faithfulness in the past, and he had seen God's faithfulness in his own life, in taking him through all kinds of trials and difficulties, and he thought on uh, God's promises. Trusting in God's character strengthens your faith. That John Macduff wrote, O you whose wisdom guides my way, even though now it seems severe, forbid my unbelief to say, there is no wisdom here. Lord, if you bend my, my spirit low, let it be love only that I shall see, because the very hand that strikes the blow was wounded once for me. Even though Abraham's feelings were most likely All over the place, he trusted God. He trusted in spite of his feelings. Just because you have those feelings doesn't mean that they have to rule the roost. The feelings are feelings. So what? We have those. 
but what what are we doing with them? Are, they don't have to lead us. They can come in line with the truths and promises of God's word. And that's what we see Abraham doing. He hoped in the Lord, knowing that the Lord was the only one who could rescue him, that the Lord was the only one who could fulfill those promises. Abraham filled his mind with the truths of God's character. And so as he did so, he grew strong in faith. Probably one of the best places, um, the most succinct uh, places that you can go to for a, just a, an all-around picture and study of God's character is Psalm 145. It contains uh, just the attributes of God there, and you can use that as a springboard to do a, a study even on your own on God's character. But truly, any kind of study, anytime you're in Bible study, anytime you're being taught from the scriptures, you're going to be learning about God's character. But now you have to take it and then apply it into your situation, your circumstances. When you're on that lonely lane and you don't want to call it loving and kindness and truth avenue or whatever, um, How are you going to respond in that moment? Are you going to apply the truths about what you know about God's character? God is faithful. God is kind. He has placed me here. He he has not set me here to wound me, but to build into my life so that I would grow into his likeness, that I would share his holiness. Okay, this brings us to our fourth point, giving God glory without a change in your situation. Oh, my Verse 20, do we have to deal with that one? We always want it, you know, to, Lord, fix it, fix it, fix it. Yet with respect to the promise of God, Abraham did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. When you trust the Lord, in spite of your feelings, in spite of your circumstances, when you declare, just like Job in Job thirteen fifteen, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. This gives God glory. And God is honored when you believe in his goodness, even when it, ex- it appears that you are not experiencing his goodness. There are some of you right now when... If you were to look at your life and you were to say, it doesn't look like this is God's goodness for me. But you can respond just like Abraham by saying, yes, I am experiencing God's goodness in spite of my circumstances. The ups and downs of our emotions, all those kinds of the circumstances that we experience, they they come upon us, but when we choose to turn our thoughts and our mind upon the Lord, that gives him glory. And it is then that we follow in Abraham's footsteps. You know, the emotions, our emotions are not the enemy, and I'm not I'm not trying to make them the enemy. They are a normal part of being human. And God uses them mightily to show what's in our hearts, to bring to light the areas that we need to grow in so that we can apply faith. Um, we need to learn to balance everything in our lives, right? We need to learn to balance our eating. We need to learn to balance our sleeping. We need to learn to balance our work and our play and our relationships and all kinds of things. But we also need to learn to balance our emotions, which isn't very popular to tell people these days, is it? Yeah, because everybody wants to have all the feels and all this, you know, it's like all the stuff and don't tell me to bring it in. What are you talking about? And, you know, it's like, no, no, there must be balance. Let us give glory to the Lord in how we are responding in this situation. Just letting our emotions lead us around is not going to give God glory. Ultimately, every single time we have a choice we need to make when we find ourselves in in a time of struggle with our circumstances and our emotions, we have to consider, do I really want to give God glory even in this? And if I do want to give him glory, What do I need to do or how do I need to think so I can respond in faith? And we need to ask ourselves, 
Am I willing to trust what God says in his word over and above how I feel in some of my circumstances? So let's talk about some specific scenarios to see if anything we've talked about can apply in real life. Okay, so here's a first scenario. You've been up for nights on end with sick children. One child after another has been up coughing with the croup, and you can feel your emotions rising and tears and anger are right below the surface. You know that getting some sleep would just fix everything if you, if you could just get some. But you know <laughs> the nighttime is still six hours away there before you're even going to have a chance to go to bed. Um, is it possible? Six hours out, your tears are right there. Is it possible even when you feel weak and vulnerable? Can you get through the evening without an outburst? Well, it is if you're willing to trust God in spite of how you feel. You can live upon Psalm 57 too. I will cry to God most high, to God who accomplishes all things for me. Lord, you accomplish all things for me. Lord, you will help me. Help me, Lord, to be a blessing to my family, to not make the situation worse. They're miserable. I'm miserable. I'm just weak and tired. Lord, will you accomplish this for me? Help me, Lord. I'm crying out to God most high. You are the mighty God. Let's talk about another scenario. Can you put your faith in the promises of God above your circumstances and feelings when you're called into your boss's office and then your boss proceeds to just jump all over you for a mistake another employee made? And even after you explain the situation um, th about what happened, your boss still stubbornly holds you responsible even though it's not your fault. And you know from that point on that your boss and the uppy-ups um, are always going to see this as a black mark against you. They're just, that's just a, 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 going to be something you're going to be dealing with. Is it possible, though you feel frustrated and maybe a little bitter at, um, at the injustice of this situation, that can you not give in to fear? What about not giving in to vengeful feelings? Is it possible to trust the Lord in that situation? Yeah, if we're willing to trust the Lord. First Peter three sixteen through 17 says that we are to keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who will revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. It is better if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right than for doing what is wrong. What about this scenario? Your husband has been working long hours, and though you keep telling yourself that he can't help it and that he's just as miserable as you are about it, you still find yourself battling resentment and frustration and loneliness. Can you be a blessing to him in spite of that and, and not give in to those feelings, those temptations? Well, you can if Hebrews 4.16 is at the forefront of your mind. Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. We can trust the Lord that he will help us to not spew out all those frustrations that aren't helpful to poor hubbies who are also struggling with their own right response. So how can we be a blessing to others? Another scenario, you've been dealing with bad hormonal changes due to PMS, some aspect of pregnancy, or maybe menopause, and you wake up every morning feeling angry and touchy. You're afraid to say anything because you don't want to say anything unkind. You find yourself battling your thoughts and feeling desperately de depressed and enveloped in blackness all day long. Yet you can stand upon the promises of God to get you through this time. And it's important to remember that God has not left you all alone in this situation. Psalm 116, 4 through 8 says, 
Then I called upon the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord, I beseech you, save my life. Isn't that how we feel sometimes, especially when hormones and and all kinds of things are, are raging? It's like, save me from myself. It says, gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is compassionate. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, and he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have rescued my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. We can apply God's word to our circumstances, and by faith we can trust him. Even if nothing changes in our situation, it is possible to trust the Lord when we're feeling emotional, when we're feeling weak, when we're feeling vulnerable, when we're feeling in over our heads. It is possible to get through life without giving way to these huge emotional outbursts. Um, We can still communicate what's going on without sinning. That's what we could, the emotions are not the problem. It's how we're doing it and what we're giving vent to. Becoming little um, human Vesuviuses is not a way that gives glory to the Lord. And so when we put our trust in the Lord and remind ourselves of the truth of his word, then we can give him glory. Now, this sounds so lovely, doesn't it? It's so lofty and wonderful. And uh, we just like, I'm going to give God glory for the rest of my life. (laughs) And it'll be wonderful. But how practically, how can we do this? Okay, so here's a few little practical steps. Number one, be balanced in how you view your circumstances. Hebrews 12.5 says this, and apparently you're, you've just had this um, in your sermon, so it won't be new to you. Um, Hebrews 12.5 says, And you've forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. That's a perfect example of thinking about your circumstances in a balanced way. So don't regard it lightly. You need to be take it seriously. The Lord is doing something. He intends your holiness in these circumstances. So don't think too lightly of that. You need to grow from it. That's what God is doing. But also don't faint under it. Whoa! You know, so that we go clear to the other end. There must be balance. So number one, be balanced in how you view your circumstances, Hebrews 12, 5. Number two, listen to and believe God's word. Don't respond like the Israel Israelites did in Exodus 6, 9, which um, says, Moses spoke thus to the sons of Israel, and they did not listen to Moses on account of their despondency and cruel bondage. He, Exodus 6, 9, the Israelites were unwilling to listen to Moses. And at the time, and according to the context, he's he's given them all this encouragement, all these different promises from God that God has given them to shore them up. And they did this. They would not listen to the life-giving, soul-strengthening words that God had imparted to Moses to strengthen them. And so we need to make sure that we listen to and believe God's word, that we are not doing this. And sometimes we are given God's soul-strengthening words um, in the form of our little friend who's sitting right next to you. And maybe you are having a little Vesuvius day, but not a very big one, but just a little bit of a, a Vesuvius day. And maybe you're spewing a little bit more. And uh, so your little friend brings some truth from God's word. And your response, your temptation is to say, yes, but when we respond to our the truth of God's word with a yes, but we are doing the exact same thing that the Israelites did to Moses in Exodus 6, 9. We will not listen. And so we want to make sure that we listen to and believe God's word. So be balanced in how you view your circumstances. Believe, listen to and believe God's word. Number three, 
put off acting on your emotions. So just put off acting on them. Understand that much of living by faith means not giving in to your emotions. And sometimes it means not even believing them. Have you ever been told a lie by your feelings? I do. I've had my feelings tell me lies. And my feelings have made me believe wicked things, even hurtful things about other people, that I haven't had a right judgment of the circumstances. And so we need to put off acting on our emotions until we've spent time with the Lord, that we've used that time to have the word of God bring order and calm to our hearts. Psalm 139 verses 23 through 24 says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. I take such comfort in knowing that I can just ask the Lord, Lord, Am, how am I thinking? Is there something wrong in how I'm thinking? Is, is there a hurtful thing here, Lord? Would you search my heart? Will you bring it to light? Help me to see where I'm off, because most likely I am. Most likely we usually are. If our emotions are high, there's usually some area that needs to be brought to the light of God's word so we can rethink it. And we, so we need to put off Um, dealing with our emotions until we spent time with the Lord. Number four, think of others. (laughs) This is one of the big helps. Um, It's mentally, it's helpful to mentally get outside ourselves at times. Just, it's time to think about something else. Uh, Serve somebody, call somebody whose circumstances are harder than our own. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 tells us, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. If we want to learn how to deal with our emotions, then oftentimes it, it just means not thinking about ourselves anymore. I just need to go think about somebody else. Have you ever, you know, kind of just said that to yourself too? I bet there's been a few of you uh, that have done that at least. Okay, just get out of your head. Go, let's let's just go serve somebody. Um, let's call somebody something. Um, so we need to think of others. That's a helpful way to deal with getting over that temptation to to not believe and trust the Lord. Number five, fill your mind with true thoughts. Fill your mind with thankful thoughts. Fill your mind with something other than how you're feeling. Feelings can be so insistent that we must labor to then think rightly. And so we have to have different scriptures ready. We need to go to God's word so that we can think on what is right and true so that the feelings won't lead us. And then we can bring those feelings back into their proper place. Feelings always do best when they follow our thoughts. So our thoughts need to be right. So we fill our mind with what's true. We fill our mind on what's um, to be thankful Colossians 3, 1 through 2 says, Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, and set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. Colossians 3, 16, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And number six, remember that God always provides a way for us to trust him. He always provides a way for us to do what is right if we will just look for it. First Corinthians 10, 13. You know, I mentioned it earlier, but there, the temptations that come at us, God always provides a way for us to obey him if we will look for it. He is faithful to stand there Upon his promises, he has said he will never leave us or forsake us. And so he will not allow you to be tempted so that I can't obey. Does, is that even possible? No. God's word tells us there's always a way for us to obey. 
So we must look for the way. Ask the Lord, will you provide a way? Lord, I'm so tempted to disobey right now. I just want to not trust you. Lord, will you provide a way for me? Help me to believe on what is true. You are faithful. You will help me so that I can endure this time of temptation. That's what 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us. John Newton, the author of the hymn, Amazing Grace, said, There is many a thing which the world calls disappointment, but there is no such word in the dictionary of faith. What to others are disappointments are to believers indications of the will of God. Our disappointments are God's way of leading us and pointing us to look to him in faith. This is what Abraham and Job and David and Paul and Peter and the Hebrew, the people of Hebrews 11 all understood that when we put our trust in the Lord above our feelings, over our feelings, in spite of our feelings, then we can more easily assess our feelings and our responses and give glory to the Lord. David said, Psalm 43, 5, Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why are you disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, because he is the help of my countenance and my God. And when we apply those truths, then the, the truths of Psalm 94 and 19 will be ours. When my anxious thoughts multiply within me, your consolations delight my soul. May this be your epitaph, just as it was Abraham's. In hope against hope, she believed so that she would become an example of faith to all who knew her. Without becoming weak in faith, she contemplated her situation, which was bleak and looked pretty miserable according to the facts. And yet with respect to the promise of God, she did not waver in unbelief. She grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able to perform. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, Thank you for listening.